as the day of uh, to learn how to use GitHub. Before starting straightforward with the webinar, I would like to say a few words about who we are. So let me actually enter full screen. So I don't know if you heard about us. I hope yes, otherwise now it's a good time to know us more. So we are Women++. Plus Plus. We are a Swiss no-profit association and our aim is here it's written to, to support women in for sure building and empowering them in tech-related field. But actually, uh, we, we aim more than that. We aim to support every kind of minority in the tech field. All those people that want to learn uh, how maybe to, to change their career path or just because they are curious and they want to, to understand more what's happening in, in, the, in the tech world. We want to help them, also maybe providing advice on how to approach new career, how to maybe gain a, a job in a specific tech field. And the way we do this is uh, through empowering people thanks to education. So one of the way we do is definitely using this uh, webinar and when hopefully all this situation with COVID will be ended also uh, on-site uh, workshops or face-to-face -face, uh, uh, and other type of events in particular. Okay, this is our team. We are seven uh, ladies and gentlemen with different backgrounds. Not all of us uh, have uh, technical backgrounds. Other ladies uh, have um, more uh, marketing, uh, business uh, backgrounds. So let's say we are, but, but all of us are curious about the, the, the tech topic. And this is one of the reasons we gather together. And let's say one of our main activities so far has been the, the realization, the organization of uh, an hackathon. I can lead that uh, is held in, in Zurich, usually by the end of the year. Uh, last year I was in November, and we received a very high number of uh, applications, uh, especially from women, and we are really proud of that. And one of the reasons is because we try to make a very, um, very uh, friendly environment with also childcare. Uh, yoga and also mentorship thanks to the sponsor that we have which we received from our from, from the the companies that that support us but as i just said i can lead is just one of the main activities we are we are trying to focus and actually one of the things that i like to to emphasize is the fact that we are a community so we help each other and so uh Mm, every time you have uh, an idea, every time you want to know more about something, something specific, please come to us and, and, and talk directly with us and we are more than happy to, to help you, to organize, or even to, 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 to invite you to, to present some topics that you are interested in. Okay, now let's uh, go to understand a bit more what is GitHub. So, just a few words on how this webinar uh, is organized. There are two parts. The first part will be led by me, Marta. Uh, it is an oral presentation about the description of, of Git and GitHub. And then the next session will be a session where Chris will show you how to create an account and will show you in a bit more uh, interactive way how to use the, the, the potentialities of Git and GitHub. So I present myself. I'm a senior data scientist in a startup, startup company based in Lausanne. And I uh, mainly work in, uh, in developing a platform for, uh, to, to, let's say, for deep learning, uh, but not only for that. And I also a member of the Women++ Plus Plus Association I joined last year. And I'm, I'm really, really happy that, that 
thanks to, to this association, I met a lot of people and I'm, I hope that, that thanks also to this activity, we, we, can stay, um, we can stay in touch, all of us, uh, uh, also in the future. Then maybe, Chris, you want to say a few words about you? Sure. Um, I'm Chris. And I am a solutions architect working for a Finnish company called Ivan. We are a uh, infrastructure as a service for um, software that supports building data pipelines. So databases, but also um, messaging and uh, stream processing. I joined WIM++ at the same time last year um, and was teaching at university with computer science and stuff before then. So uh, what better way to use those skills than to uh, show how to use GitHub and uh, introduction to, to using Git and the, the tools around it as well. But first, Marta has some things to say. Yeah, actually, I just forget to say about questions. So of course, all questions are more than welcome. Um, please, uh, I, I suggest you that you write all your questions in the chat so that uh, uh, while I'm speaking, Chris will have a look at them and try to reply to those uh, that are easier. Otherwise, we will uh, uh, try to answer them at the end of my presentation. At, at, at the same time, I mean, at, in, in the same way, we will do with, with the Chris part. So I will take care of the questions on the on your live chat okay very good so if you are ready i think we can start what do you think chris yeah okay so first of all let's say what is git git is a version control system that uh, allows the user to store projects so basically files codes etc and access them and access their type of history at different time at different points in time so for example if you uh, if you create a document and you edit and then tomorrow you want to change something using git you can have access to all the history of changes that you have in the document What is a, vers a version control system? As I just said, this helps you in keep track of the changes you made in the in the files. Uh, it's also very useful for collaborative environments, so allows team of people to work in the same files and know who is doing what and who and which change has made by who and when. And also very important. It allows you to revert your changes and go back to a previous state. So especially when you develop a software, this is extremely important because uh, even if you are working alone or more important, if you're working a team, having track of the history of the change you made to the code sometimes can even save, save your life. And I guess all of us more or less found in, in these type of situations, no? where you, uh, you first create your, your document, then you edit, then you come back. And so in order to keep track of both versions, what you do is you copy and you name it with, a, with another name. No? So doc one underscore final. Then you add additional changes, but you want to keep track of, of the, 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 the previous one. So you copy and maybe in a new way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you will end up with a huge long list of files that is basically the same file, but keeping track of all the, the, of the, the, the changes of this, the changes that you have made. So this can make you crazy, right? Yeah. So I guess this may make kind of really, really describe uh, the, probably the situation in which most of you uh, find themselves. So uh, definitely Git is a great tool for, for uh, backup, but of course the, 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 the powerful and the reason why uh, GitHub exists is the fact that 
you don't need a backup only on your laptop, on your personal machine, but you also need an external place or even multiple places where you want to store your project. This is, of course, for, 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 uh, for safe reasons. And so there are several options. Uh, not only GitHub, there is also GitLab, Bitbucket, and much more than those. But for sure, um, GitHub is uh, one of the most used and there's a very, very easy uh, user interface that Chris will show you in a moment. And so this is one of the reasons we, we decided to, to explain GitHub first. Okay, so uh, here you can see how the, the homepage of GitHub looks like. So this is the, 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 the page where you can create your account. And the, the question then is, but what is this GitHub, right? So uh, the, the, let's say the technical definition is a social code hosting platform for software development version control using Git. Yeah, it sounds complicated, but the idea is uh, what I just said, the fact that you, of course you store your projects locally, but at the same time you want an external machine where to, to store and have the backup of all your history. And GitHub is the place where you do that. So how does it work? You have a project store on your local machine. Let's call this a local repository. Basically, you can think as a folder with several files. Uh, and then you have a remote copy of this folder hosted on GitHub server. And so uh, when you start to, to create your project, what you have to do, of course, is, is to work locally, but then every time you save changes locally, you have also to synchronize with the folder hosted on the GitHub in order to have every time uh, up to date uh, uh, track changes uh, of your uh, of your project in both places uh, it's very important to to also use uh, the help of the community because uh, um, being a tool especially for software development you will find a lot of uh, a lot of problems maybe when you do a commit and sometimes you get aborted because you didn't configure the 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 the, the commit you were doing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, plenty of different uh, problems can arise, and so it's important that there is a place hosted on on the GitHub forum in which you can share your problems as well as solutions and idea with the people there. Okay, uh, we also have a, a GitHub repository the one of women plus plus and it was extremely useful for us because uh, uh, when we organized our hackathon all the team hosted their project on our repo so that then we can check all of the project and and at the end also decide the, the the winning team so we don't use only for that we also use to host uh, also the material that we create for the learning uh, activities that we do. For the moment, we have only a few projects, but for sure, uh, the more we do this type of webinar as well as this type of project, the more we will add the material on that place and you, you are more than welcome to check there, uh, also maybe to, to, to add your ideas there, etc. Okay. So let's let's start to understand a bit more Git. So uh, the basic idea is that Git records what all your files in the repo look like at a given point in time. Uh, and of course, you can assign the point in time in which you want to record the status of the files. So uh, let's let's call this to take a snapshot of how the files look like at that point in time. And you have the possibility to visit at any time you want the snapshot you recorded. Uh, 
uh, one of the main concepts of Git is commit. And, and Chris will show you uh, in, in his, uh, in his uh, uh, part of the talk that in order to create, to take a snapshot in time of the project, uh, you have, of course, to, to, to tell the, the, the version control system uh, that you want to do the snapshot. And so when you do git commit, you are actually doing that. So you are telling your system to take a snapshot of the project at that point in time. Um, and basically, from a bit more technical point of view, this git commit consists of all the info related to how the files changed from the previous uh, version that you recorded in time. Uh, there is also a sort of messages reference uh, to the commit to, um, let's say, give a brief descri description on what type of changes you made to your files. For example, fix bugs or uh, added uh, a line to the code, this type of, of, of reference. And then there is a hash code name. That is the way that, that, that the, 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 the tool is able to then uh, go back to each commit, so to take track of each commit. But of course, the, the hash code is um, automatically assigned by the software. It's something that, that you don't have to, to generate manually, but, but it's the software that does it for you. Okay, so uh, uh, the, and another concept that is important uh, in, uh, in using Git is the concept of a branch. A branch is a list of commits. So it's a list of snapshots in time of uh, your files, of your project. It's like having uh, a, an album of photos. So a branch, if you want, is an album of photos that tells you at each time you took the photo how the project was looking like. Of course, you can create many albums, you can create many branches. The main branch is called the master. Well, I mean, master actually is the default name. Then, of course, you can give the name that you want. And the reason why there are several branches is because, as I told you at the beginning, Git is designed to be a tool for uh, for team, so to collaborate with others in developing software usually. But the problem is that when you work in a team, this might be really hard, especially if you work in the same file, right? Because you can introduce a lot of bugs, etc. And so the way uh, Git tried to solve these issues of collaborative uh, environment was to allow each developer, let's say, each, each, each uh, uh, team member to create a branch, so to create sort of a list of, of uh, or, or an album of photos of snapshot in which develop the part of the code or the part of the project that he or she wants to do in order, and, and avoid the conflict with developing of the other team's member. And then, and, 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 and this is, uh, let's say, how, from, from a visual perspective, a Git project looks like. So you can see, basically, that you have a, series, a sequence of commits that are those green boxes with the, uh, identified each with an, an hash code. And you can see that there is an arrow uh, for each box that points from the, the, the child to the parent, in the sense that uh, every time you do a commit, the new commit can be considered the child of the previous commit that is considered the parent. And here you can see basically that the branch in UR, uh, the current branch in which you are, let's assume that you are in the master, usually points to the, the most, uh, the, to the latest commit that you have done. In this case, this ED489. And, uh, and uh, from this, you can see that, that, that this, uh, this master branch is this sequence of commits of point in time. So you see, 
Okay, let, let's come back to here. You can see these, uh, uh, this name, head. What is a head? A head is uh, uh, defined as the point where you are right now. So, because what I told you is that you can have uh, uh, multiple branches with different type of commits. And uh, you need to know, of course, uh, right now where you are, in, in which branch you are, and what was the last commit you've done. And this is the role of the head. And the, the, the head points to a particular branch. As I said, usually by default, it points to the, the, the latest commit of the master. And if you switch to another branch, uh, this from a, a technical terminolo terminology is named as checkout. So if you check out to another branch, then the head will point to the latest commit of the new branch. Okay, so um, this uh, is a sketch on how it looks like to have uh, uh, more than one branch. So as you can see, you started from the left, you started with uh, only one branch represented by C0, C1, C2, C4. So C0, C1, C2 are the first, uh, the, the, the first commit belonging to uh, only one branch that by definition, as I said, is the master. Then uh, after C2, uh, the user created a new branch uh, that was defined by commit C3. And he developed uh, the feature, and so he, he keep adding commits to this new branch, this uh, ISS53. But at the same time, when he did the commit uh, in the in the ISS53, maybe another uh, team member did another commit in the master. So you can see that the the, the existence also of the commit C4. But this commit C4 belongs only for the moment to the master branch. Okay. So let's assume that, uh, let's say, you finalize the, the feature you were developing in your uh, branch. And now you said, okay, now I'm ready to uh, take what I've done and put in the same file that also all the other team members can have it on their, uh, on their uh, let's say, on, on the project. And so you want to merge your branch with the master. And basically what happens here is that now C5 uh, will, uh, actually, sorry, C6 will point both to C5, which is the last commit of the, of the EISS53 branch, and also will point to C4, which was the latest commit of the master branch. And so in, in this way, basically, you started having uh, uh, only one branch at C0. Then at, at a certain point, you decided at C2, OK, now I need to create a new branch to develop a new feature independently from the, the, from the master. So that you develop independently. And at the end, at C6, you decide, OK, now it's the time to merge again with the master. And this means that now the master contains also the changes that you have done in the, in the other branch. And in this way, you, the, the team is able to independently work on separate, let's say, issues, on separate features, on separate uh, objects. And then when they are ready, they can all merge their work in the masters. Let's, call, let's consider master as sort of production-ready uh, product. OK. More or less, this was the, the, the idea on how uh, Git and also GitHub works from more a theoretical perspective, let's say. Uh, I think now there is a bit of time for questions. What do you think, Chris? Yeah. So. <laughs> Wait for it. Yeah. 
so people can unmute themselves when they have a question to ask, um, or if you prefer, you can also put it in the chat here, um, and we'll put all those in a document. It also means if you have a question while we're going through some stuff, throw it into the chat um, box, which you should see on the right. If you don't, there's a little speech bubble button towards the bottom of your screen, um, and you can use it that way. Um, Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, it's you, Katrina speaking. I have a question. If it's possible to block a part of the code so no one can change it? Um, do you mean a particular part of the code? Or... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we'll cover that a little bit. So there's a couple of options. Um, basically, no. Um, but you can set different permissions on repositories, which we'll cover. Um, and you can also set it so, for example, um, you can't, certain people in your company then can't push to the master branch. Um, so it stops some things being edited. However, when it is a particular piece of code, it's a bit more complex and you have to use a feature in Git called submodules. Um, which is basically like a private repository that your repository relies on. So you tell Git that you have this private block of code that you want to use. And then when you clone it onto your local machine, um, it will bring that down with it um, as long as you have access as well. But that is a fairly okay. intense topic on Git. Like it's, it's a pretty advanced usage of Git, but if it mm -hmm. is something you're interested in, um, then it, it probably is something we can do as a follow on from this webinar as well of like, now we've introduced Git and GitHub and how to use it, then kind of really using Git in production and the mm -hmm. real command line usages and sub modules, Git ignores and triggers and these things. But anyway, it's always like there is automatic backup. So you always have pre versions of the work that you have done. So it's not that crucial if someone, let's say, by accident deletes some part of the code, right? Mm -mm. No, I mean, I'm pretty sure every developer at some point has pushed something to the master branch yeah. when they didn't want to. Um, so mm -hmm. you have a whole bunch of options. So Git checkout isn't specific to like specifying a branch. You can also specify a commit. So you can check out a particular point in history that you want, and yeah. it will put back. But you also have cherry pick and rollback. There are a few commands built in to basically say, didn't mean to do that. Can we, mm -hmm. can we go back to how it was before? OK, cool. Thanks. Thanks. Anything else? Uh, Are you going to talk about forking and its usage rather than using checkout from the master? We okay, are that's indeed. Something. Yeah, we are. Thanks, Martina, for the question. And this isn't the only point for questions. When you do have anything else, um, you can send it to, to the chat. Uh, equally, you can send it to uh, myself. Or, or Marta, and and we'll see it separately. But if there is nothing else, so I guess probably it's easier to uh, visualize directly during your presentation. Probably people will have much more questions there. Hopefully. So, Otherwise, it means that we are too good in explaining or we suck a lot. <laughs> Let's hope <laughs> not the second one. <laughs> yep. We're about to find out. No, don't, don't worry it's not about the second one. Yeah. <laughs> Just we, we would like to have an example of how you really uh, yeah, practice, how you create an account and everything. I, I believe so. Absolutely. Cool. OK, so we'll get started. I'll go through a sign up. Can everyone see? my browser window We're on the GitHub homepage. That works for everyone? Cool. Um, so in the interest of time, here's one I made earlier. This is me already signed in. 
um, but let's go through the process of creating an account um, anyway. Oh, no, I don't want to automate that. Sign up. So here, I guess when GitHub first launched, finding a username was pretty easy, but now millions of people are on it. You have to be a bit more creative. Um, so this has to be unique and github.com slash username will be where all of your code is stored. Um, in most cases, if you're applying for a development role, that is basically the CV or the resume. They will look at this and uh, see public contributions and projects that you've worked on and things like this. So also make sure the name isn't offensive or a little bit weird or rude. Um, so in this case, we can put women plus plus, which is taken something like this, and then like this, throw in a password, and that's it. You put the information in here, and then select a plan. In this case, it's the free plan. Um, yep, yeah, I mean, most of the, the free stuff in Git is, is more than enough. We can click on compare plans as well. So you can see those things. Um, once that's been selected, you click sign up. It will send an email to the address that you provided. Click on the link to confirm. Show in big screen. Um, so how does it look right now? Not big enough? Better? Maybe if I make it full screen. Yeah, but it's there is still possibility to zo to zoom in because I don't know what everyone else has seen, but in the first it was like super long uh, rectangle, you know, with gray screen next to. Because probably you have told them, I don't know. And uh -huh. then you, you can still zoom in uh, with like a bar, so it can uh, it can resolve this problem. Yeah. Okay, let me see if I've got new options. Full screen participants. Does that make it any better? How is that? Is that easy enough to read or not so much? Yeah, it's better. That's fine, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so once you've done this, click on the link. It will tell you sign in, um, and that's it. You'll have access to GitHub. Um, I guess while you're doing this, maybe it's reasonable. GitHub started, I think, maybe nine, eight or nine years ago. Um, it was bought by Microsoft recently, um, and it's been going through the transition to Microsoft things. Um, it's not as bad as it sounds since that's happened. GitHub has made a lot of their um, stuff that was previously behind a monthly subscription available for free. And if you are a student or working for a nonprofit organization, um, then there's a bunch of stuff available for you. In particular, if you are a student, this GitHub student developer pack is magical. Um, you get hundreds of dollars of things for free. Um, learning uh, tutorials for Amazon Web Services, but also domain names and um, hosting in uh, cloud providers like DigitalOcean and Azure and things like JetBrains, which is uh, a collection of IDEs or code development tools for Python, Android, Java, SQL, all of those things. So definitely worth signing up when you use your university email address. Okay, 
if anyone does have any problems viewing the screen, then uh, do let me know. I have a very wide monitor, so I don't actually know how it does look for other people. And I don't know if making it this size is better or not. Possibly not. Um, I don't know if it's also easier just to share my desktop, but yeah, let me know if you are having problems. I think it should be fine now, Chris. I mean, it, it looks quite big in mine at least. Okay. Um, cool. So once you have clicked on those links, You can go to github.com forward slash the username that you set up for yourself. And there, this is basically like your home screen. This overview tab shows things that you've taken part in or um, projects that you've contributed to. Along the top here, these are kind of the Twitter or Facebook style stats, um, repositories, projects, packages, stars. Stars act as like bookmarks. So when you click here, if you come across another repository that you think is quite useful, um, then you can click on the star button here. And it means you can access it then from your profile. So maybe you see it when you're walking your dog or something and you want to check it out later. Adding it as a star means uh, you can check it out. Couldn't see. Is that uh, OK? Is it yeah, someone, now? so Carla said that, that she couldn't see. OK, yes. So I don't know if you notice people, but there is a, a, a button that you can click and this zoom uh, the, the page that Chris is, is showing you. And this should help you in, in, in visualizing better. But I'll note this for next time. I'll present off of my laptop screen and not a 50-inch monitor. That probably makes more sense. Um, to monitor. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for the feedback as well. Though this is useful to know. Um, obviously, it's nice just to sit back and click on stuff. But if you're trying to view a, a 49-inch web page on a 13-inch screen, it's probably not super fun. So I hope by right-clicking and seeing it at 200% does work. Um, otherwise, I'll zoom in even more. If we need to. Um, OK, so that's covering stars, repositories. Here is every repository that I've created on GitHub since I started. Some of them are public. Some of them are private. Um, you can see at the top of the tab, there's 148 in total. And then you can then filter them. So when you do have a bunch of projects um, actually searching for something, it's quite useful. And you can see I gave up on maintaining some of them nine years ago. So you will find you probably use your GitHub profile more than you would do in other tools. The reason behind that is because there are um, security features when you want to pull code from GitHub onto your local machine. Usually, your um, password is OK, but sometimes they'll want things like SSH keys. We'll talk about these in a little bit um, and how to generate them. You need to use them on. Uh, separate machines. So on Linux, it works a bit differently to how it works on Windows and these things. 
but we'll come across that uh, a bit later on. And in a future webinar, we'll actually cover generating them and using them and get in the command line. Okay, so first, we're gonna go through a fairly popular Git repository provided by GitHub, just to look at all the features around a repository. And the primary benefit of this one is it isn't code-based. So if anyone here is coming from a zero development background, um, it's a good one to check out. So the search feature in GitHub is pretty good, but do note if you are inside a repository, it will try and search inside the repository first before searching the rest of GitHub. So here you see open source.guide, search all of GitHub. But if I did click on an open source project like this, when I search for the same, the first option here is in this repository, which in most cases is not that useful. So normally make sure to double check the number of times I've hit enter and gone to the wrong place. It's, it gets kind of annoying. Um, so results page on GitHub, the most obvious stuff, I guess that you'll be using will be the languages. If you are a JavaScript developer, being able to filter by JavaScript um, is useful. And equally, if you're not looking for the name of a repository, but rather an issue that someone's mentioned, which again, we'll cover, or a particular user also, then uh, it's good to use these filters on the left. Usually I sort by recently updated because especially in the case of JavaScript and things, code that is a year old is usually either abandoned or not up to date. So best match is sometimes useful, but equally um, when it is code and it was updated five years ago, might not be so great to use. That's not true for everything, of course. Okay, so this is a guide um, written and provided by GitHub on how to contribute to open source projects. And it really covers everything, resources uh, you can use, ways of working, people you can contact, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and it isn't targeted at people that are already developers or people that are super experienced or that people that have only done a PhD or something else. Um, Clicking on that takes you to the actual built version of the guide, which you can click around. We can send these links out again afterwards, um, after the webinar. So really you have all these kind of guides, not purely around the code also, but about how to work together when you are distributed around the world, um, how to be welcoming, how not to uh, offend others and, uh, and those kind of things. Okay, so let's cover the code. In this case, it's primarily text with a bit of code, but still it's useful. Here we have two of the most important files in any Git repository. That is the readme and the license. The readme file, when someone looks at your um, code, this is the first thing that will be loaded in the root of your repository. So when someone goes to github.com forward slash your username forward slash my super cool project, or in this case, github forward slash open source dot guide, this will get shown, okay? And what it really looks like is, now that's gonna look awful, but it's just, a text file using a, a style of formatting called Markdown. Again, if people are interested, we can cover this a bit later. Um, and if we have time, I can go through some Markdown samples. But the aim of the README is to show people that are coming to your repository what it does, why it does it, how it does it. So what it does, why it does it, and then how it does it. So in this case, when it's text-based, it's why did they write this guide? What prompted them to do it? And how can you how can you help? How can you take part? 
in this case, the site is powered by Jekyll, which is um, a static site building framework, um, which is why you'll see some code inside the repository itself, not just a bunch of HTML files. The license is important here. GitHub has quite a cool way of telling you um, what your license does and when you change it, um, what it means. It's reasonable when you write your first um, repositories, right, start writing your first bits of code that you don't include a license file. That's okay. But when you start using uh, third-party software or if you start making money from um, any of the code that you've written, this is when you need a license file because you may be using software that already exists that does have a license that says you can't use it unless you link back to that software or you can't use it when you're making money um, from that software. So a lot of the stuff you'll find Creative Commons or MIT or um, GPL, when you set them, you can add them in this interface and GitHub will then explain the outline of what that license means. And in this case, you can use it for commercial use, you can modify it, you can distribute it, you can store it on your own hard drive, but you're saying if anyone uses your code, then you're not responsible if it breaks. So they can't phone you in the middle of the night and say, why isn't it working anymore? You can say, it's not my problem. Okay. It was kind of asked as a question um, for restricting access to bits of code, but we have this git ignore file. This is a file that you're basically telling git when I have files on my machine that I don't want other people to see, don't include them when I push them to GitHub. In this case, you can see that person was probably using a Mac because this is the hidden file uh, folder included in um, each new folder created in Mac. And these are then hidden files uh, created by Ruby and Jekyll. And then we can see here, some of these things are built and there's some tests also they don't want to include. If you just write the name of the folder, it will uh, include everything inside that folder as well. Um, and you can specify just a single file name and you can use things like wildcards or whatever else. So this is super useful, especially, um, I'm not sure if anyone here has done much um, web development stuff like including your node modules is generally quite intense because sometimes this can be 100 megabytes of, uh, of files. So maybe you want to not include them in, a, in your repository. Okay, is everybody happy with that so far? It seems so. For the moment, no questions on the chat. Okay. so. This is the home page of what you would see for your repository. From there, if you're working on this repository, you might want to bring it onto your machine. So you can click on this clone or download here, HTTPS, you have a link which you can copy. You can also just download the zip folder or when you've added um, keys to your Git profile, then you can use SSH. And if you are working for a company, um, usually they'll restrict it. So you can only um, bring private repositories onto your machine when you protect your profile with an SSH key. When you're working in public repositories, HTTPS is usually okay. Um, and we'll cover this towards the end of the session um, here. Cool. So Marta talked about having a master branch and there are options for other branches. So here, they've kind of followed different naming options, but here someone's username and something they're working on. 
So the master branch is the default branch, the one everyone will see. But when you want to look at something else, you can click on the branch and then view what the code looks like in that state. When you're happy with that branch, you finished with the work and you want it to be in the master, that's where you can click compare. And then GitHub will load file view that shows you everything that's changed between your branch and the master. When you're happy with that, um, you can then uh, open up a pull request. So these are changes that people want to make as part of the open source community. So in this case, someone's added a Persian translation or Russian translation, Korean translation. Um, when you want to do this, the first thing you have to do is fork that repository. So here is that button, fork. When we do this, which we can do here, what GitHub will do is grab that repository and the master branch and create a copy of it in your account. So basically, the old school way of doing this would be to go back to the original, clone it onto your machine like this, open up your terminal and clone it, and then go here to the big plus, new repository, create one with a similar name. And it's quite a complicated, tedious process. So when you click fork, it automates all of this for you and just creates a, uh, a clone of that repository in your own user space. Um, but on top of that, it maintains the link between the two. So you can see that the history exists, that your repository was once part of um, the original repository here, the GitHub open source guide. So now we can go back to my user. Go to repositories. And here we see the forked repository. And in this case, let's make a quick edit. So we'll open the git ignore file and I will add node modules. Cool. And here, this is a git commit. Usually you'd be doing them in the in the command line, but GitHub has a pretty powerful text editor as well. So um, it's now perfectly reasonable to be doing it inside, um, inside the browser. So now it says update git ignore, which is true. Now we can say added node modules to reduce size of repository. We have two options here, commit directly to the master branch or create a new branch for this commit and start a pull request. And then here, we can say, and see my, that's my username and nor node modules. Cool. And then it will create a pull request. Once that happens, the original maintainers of the repository, so the people at github forward slash open source dot guide, will then have to look at this and see if they approve it or not. Once they approve it, then it gets merged into the master branch at github slash open source dot guide. And um, that's it. You've just contributed to an open source um, repository on GitHub. Pretty exciting, I know. Um, these things we don't need to cover so much, but you can see that these some things have already been filled out um, when creating the pull request. 
Um, and these are templates that you can set in the repository. So when someone creates an issue or a pull, re pull request, um, it will already add some sample text for them. So they're not just writing and they have no idea what to say or what they've done. But I can say here that yes, I followed the contribution guidelines and have I explained what my changes do and why they add value. And that's cool. We can then preview that. That's all great. And then it will create the pull request and then they can merge it if they want to. Everybody happy with that so far? Are there any particular features of GitHub that people do want to see that I haven't covered yet? Mm. Okay. Maybe, uh, Chris, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you were planning to show eventually how to delete a commit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was a question in the, in the chat. There was a couple of... But about when it, was it something about when it wasn't on their machine? Uh, for yeah, game, so I, I would like to know if I did a commit but don't push it yet, how can I revert that commit? Okay, well, that might get semi-technical, but mm. let's do it. Okay, we will cover that question, but since we're still in the browser, before I switch to a terminal, then uh, just covering issues in um, GitHub first, and then we'll have a look at that. So for those of you that are new to development or working in web development, this is a fun repository to try out. It's called Calsay. You can just install it using NPM into your terminal, which we can try in a second. And basically it just prints a cow into your command line. It says stuff that you make it say. The reason I show this repository is because it's active. Um, and it is used by people active in terms of last commit was two years ago. But there's two features here that are relatively new to, to GitHub and um, they're worth checking out. So the first here is releases. When you mark something as a release in GitHub, then it creates this page. So for example, if you're making an Android app or a desktop app or something, Having these releases means you can show people the latest version of that so they can go there and download it. It also means you don't have to make a separate website that hosts the, the actual executable file like an EXE or a DMG or whatever else. Um, you can just link to this and everyone can see not only the code, but also um, your releases, what changed, um, and then download it to their machine. The other thing that's useful then is packages, which is if you are working on a library, then you can publish these packages directly to GitHub as well. So if you are making something for NPM or for Python, this is the place um, you can push it up and then people can download them. The final thing to cover before we open up the terminal then is issues. This is where everyone tells you how much your code sucks. Um, it is where you would focus when you're working with a bunch of people on, on a project together. When you find something that isn't working, if you fix it yourself, great, you can open a pull request, but maybe you're just a user of that software and you want to tell the person that wrote it, it's not working on Windows or it fails when I run it on my MacBook Air something else. Um, and in this case, someone said it, it doesn't build. Then you can read the issue that they've created and follow it along. People may have commented and said, it works for me, or I solved it in this way. And once a solution has been found, 
then that issue becomes closed. So here, close this. So an open issue is something that is yet to be resolved in your code. Um, and then once it's closed, that means either you fixed it in the code base um, or you're closing it because it's not relevant or you don't plan to fix it. The benefit of having this is it's an open and transparent history then for everyone on how you've worked together and how you've addressed um, issues that have come up. So it's a pretty good log of seeing what's gone wrong and you can direct users to check out issues um, if they're looking for a particular solution to something. Okay, so that covers most of the things around um, GitHub since we have a bit of time. Then maybe Chris, before uh, switching to the terminal, uh, would you like to give a few words about the wiki? Uh huh, yes. So the wiki in GitHub is based on this uh, piece of software similar to what we talked about before called Jekyll. In this case, it's called Gollum. Um, it's a static site builder where you can clone it separately on your machine. It's basically a, a separate repository, or you can edit it directly in GitHub, which is great for people that are working in your company that maybe aren't developers. Then they can update the wiki with things they found useful or tips on using the software and these things. Um, then you can create these pages, edit them in Markdown, adding headings um, and formatting text, and then publishing those pages. If you don't want to use the GitHub um, web page, then you can clone it onto your machine and uh, edit it then yourself um, locally. I don't know if I have an example of something that is using the wiki. Maybe. Kind of. So here, there's two pages already added to the wiki. And you see this link here to clone it locally. So you can then run it on your machine. Cool. Are there any other questions, any feedback, anything you want to see, anything you want to know? Not yet. Okay, then. I think we can switch to the terminal. Let's do it. Okay. Sorry. This is the scary part. Yeah, this is where I show you all. I have no idea what I'm talking. Um, let me find a terminal. Yeah. Can you all see a terminal? Can you increase? I sure can. Whoop. How's that? Much better. Oh, now it's big. Yes, very good. Or we can do it here also. Excellent. How can everyone read this when I type like that? Hang on a second. Let me get rid of some of the things in the prompt so you don't see the. Don't show us uh, secrets. Here we go. It should be easier to look at now. Right, that's easier? Probably. Okay, cool. Let's do some terminal stuff. Okay. Let me make a directory um, and we'll call it git test
Uh -huh. Cool. Now we have a folder. If we could see, here's the path to it. Top notch. Um, Git knows nothing about this. Um, GitHub also knows nothing about this. So what we can do is git init, which creates that repository. So now Git is tracking or has the capability to track um, the files in this folder. So now we create a readme, and then we can create other folders relevant to our code. Um, so with NPM, maybe you have like a, a, a node modules or a source folder that you want to check out, then uh, yeah, it's your choice. You can, you can add all the things you like. So in this case, we have a readme, which we should edit and say a sample git repo. That's cool. And since this repository is going to do some stuff. Um, let's add this. Now we have two files in there. First, we tell Git, we add the readme, and then we commit that file. So that's the initial commit, because it's the first thing. Now, we created a Git repository. We created two files. We've added one of those files to Git, and Git's now tracking it. That's cool. Um, but we did write a second file. So now we can say it add secrets.txt. Whoops. Mm -hmm. So here, now I've made a huge mistake and added my secrets file. Not ideal. We can see this with the git log command. Let me clear the screen so that's a bit easier to look at. Here, we see the initial commit, and it has this big old alphanumeric um, string with it. And then we see this one with another big old alphanumeric string. See how it points? head and master. So the head of my repository, the, the tip, the latest part of my repository on the master branch. What we want to do is get rid of this one because we don't want the secrets file. When you want to undo that, you have a couple of options. you can decide um, which one you want to go with. But for this case, then we will do git reset because it's nice. It's nice and it's easy to remember. And when you're running it on your machine, um, it's not gonna it's not gonna mess anything up. Obviously when it's a repository for your company, be careful. So here we can do git reset head. And that is this little thing up here. So we're saying use this tilde. We basically want to go back by one. 
Sorry, this dog is attacking me. There you go. Now we've got back one commit before we pushed it up to the master branch. Um, and we want to make sure we never do that again. So in this case, I can say, let's create a git ignore file that includes secrets.txt. Now, when you list your directory, you'll see it's not there because this pesky will stop. In this case, we can do lsa, which means all, and it will show us hidden files as well. So one command that probably a lot of tutorials will show you, but you should not use is this one. Because this will add everything, all the things. So if you have another folder with a secrets file, three folders deep, it will get added here. So when you haven't updated your git ignore, um, it's, it's not really safe to use. Your best bet is always to add files and folders explicitly instead of just saying a wildcard for everything. But in this case, we trust me, I'm pretty safe. Now we can say added git ignore. Cool. Now we can see, let's do that again. Now we can see we basically rewritten history according to Git that technically we've made three commits, the initial commit, adding the secrets, and then the git ignore, but we deleted the middle one so people don't see um, that I added a file that I shouldn't have. Cool. Um, yeah. Maybe you can show also the git status. Yes. So here, nothing to commit. Everything's great. But I now create a new file and then run git status again. And now it's saying you've made something else. You should add it and then commit it. But now we're in the command line when we might actually want to create a repository. So in GitHub, you can then click the plus in the top right, click create new repository, and then give it a name. Once you go through that, it will um, give you a URL. And in that case, you would do git remote add origin, and then the um, you have a, a git URL that looks something like this. Once that's done, you can then push these changes. So everything that you've committed will get pushed up from origin to master. So origin is how you can view your machine it's the origin of this, of this code. And then master is the, is the remote master branch that GitHub is holding for you. Once you run that, or in this case, it will definitely fail. But um, when you set up the repository, GitHub will show it. And you'll then be able to see the files that you've created, the readme file that you wrote. And people can then create issues um, and you can track the changes. That's pretty much everything I was expecting to cover. Do we, we, want to, we want to create a branch and check out? 
Yes. Just okay. as in us. Wait, there is Flavio. Flavio is asking, is there a way to push a local rip on GitHub without initialize one first on GitHub? Kind of. But yeah, it's a bit different. Um, can you see when I'm switching to the browser? Yeah, we see. Ah, cool. OK. So um, there is this tool. Um, there may be another way, but I'm not sure of one. This is the only way that I know. Uh, GitHub has this CLI tool. Um, you can install it on your machine um, through the methods on uh, in their readme file, and we can share a link for it as well. Um, but basically, once you install it, it can do all of the things that the normal Git um, tool on your machine can do, as well as things specific to GitHub. So like looking at pages, the wiki, um, pull requests, and those things. So if you are just getting started with GitHub, I'd recommend probably not to use it straight away just so you get comfortable with Git first. Um, but for for things like um, creating issues from the command line and, and repositories, it, it can be quite useful. Um, and in this case, then when you have it installed, um, what do they have for Linux? Ah, they have a dev file. So once it's running, Probably I should be able to install it. Yes. I have it installed. No. Ignore this. But I'll see if I can install the GitHub CLI thing and show you how it works. But we might not get time. But if that does install, um, there you can use the gh command. The first thing you have to do is authenticate it. Um, then it will ask for your username and password, and it will store it locally on your machine. And then gh repo, and then create. Um, who knows what that's doing now? Um, While it does, no, nope. nope. Sorry, that would have been nice to be able to show, but uh, we can also make sure we cover using the GitHub CLI tool um, in a further webinar. But we will send the link to to the repository so you can install it and try it out on your own machines. Hopefully, when the uh, quarantine time is over then we can do something in person, which makes it a lot easier to help with uh, code troubles. In any case, uh, in any case uh, we can also have a, a chat about mm -hmm. this. Yeah. Separately, maybe. So, so okay, Flavio is happy. Cool, OK. Excellent. So we've got a few minutes to try um, branches. So we can do git branch all, showing all those branches. And when you're in doubt, putting minus, minus, and h um, next to a git command will show you what that thing can do and what options are available. Um, so it's useful even if you remember the git commit command, but you're not sure what the next thing to put is. Put minus h, and then it will say right at the top, git commit, but it then also is looking for maybe you add the author. Minus m is super useful. Um, 
because um, minus m allows you to add the message. So the actual commit message that people will see when they look at the history. Um, and one other one you may actually find useful is amend, um, which means you just want to change the previous commit and not the uh, not create a new one. So git commit minus minus amend means that you're just changing the one you just made. So you don't have to delete the whole commit and, and reset and go back. You can just amend it and maybe remove a file, for example. Um, so in this case, we can do it with git branch. We have all delete, move, show. So there's a, a bunch of options. Um, for renaming branches, creating new branches, and uh, seeing what branches you have on your machine, like this, because we have just one. We can then create a new branch and check it out directly by doing git checkout minus b, and then new branch. Now we can run that same command again. Ta-da, another branch. So now you can do extra work on this. I just to remind to the audience that git add is the command used by git to add a file locally to your repo. And then when you do git commit, this takes the snapshot of the changes you've made. And minus m means that you are, is the message that you associate with this commit. And then you can see also a3, e6, ae1, that is the hash code. So now you can see it here. We have created a new branch. So this is where the master branch currently is. This is where we are in a new branch. Um, so we can then hit checkout master, which means we'll switch then back to our master branch. When we run that again, the third commit is missing. So then we can git merge, new branch. Ta-da. Now we have merged a new branch into this. And we can delete that branch now. Now it's gone. we only see a single branch. You may sometimes get the message of you're trying to delete a branch that um, is still ahead of the master. It still has more commits than the master branch has. That is Git warning you and saying, you probably haven't merged um, or you probably don't want to merge yet. So um, don't do it, basically. In that case, you can normally make this a capital D and it will do it. Um, but it is not recommended. Usually when Git gives you a warning about something, it thinks it has a good reason uh, to be doing it. So do make sure um, that's been, that you double check. Okay. I think, yeah. The last thing, probably, I don't know if we have time and if people are still uh, interested on this last bit, the SSH key. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you think we have enough time to, to show also that, or maybe we can leave this for another workshop on Git. I mean, we have a recording of this, I guess. So if people want it, then we can do it in a few minutes. 
what is the view of people. Throw it in the chat if if you'd like us to go through it in the last five minutes. Okay. People, raise a hand if you would like to ask you also how to set up an SSH key. Yes, please, sure. Okay, sounds good for them. Oh. Okay. So, so let's take these last five minutes to show this to our audience. Okay. Cool. Um, when you're on Windows, it will be slightly different to this, but um, you can use PowerShell and it's still kind of similar. Um, but if people are on Windows and struggling, you can also reach out to us and uh, we can point you at some resources to help you set it up. But here you'll be using a tool called SSH Keygen. You just run it like this and it will ask, where do you want us to save it to? In this case, I want it to go into my home directory. Oops. And in a folder called SSH git test. Like that. Hang on a second. The folder is in. There we go. SSH git test. Bloop. And it will ask you for a passphrase. It doesn't have to be the same as the password for your GitHub account. And should be secure. In this case, I'm going to go against all the rules and put no password in there. Then enter it again, make sure, um, and it will reject it when it's it's the wrong one twice. And then for POW, didn't make that directory. That's cool. So let's first make the directory and run it again. Page gets test. What? Oh, it is the directory. Fine. Okay, then we'll do it like this. It just doesn't think it exists. Well, <laughs> okay, that's what happens when we do it last minute, I guess. Um, when you're running it for the first time on your machine, the path that it recommends, which is here, your home directory dot ssh forward slash id underscore rsa, that's good. You just press enter. Um, you don't need to change it. But of course, in my case, when I press enter here, it will say, do you want to overwrite this? And I will say no, because I use this for my current GitHub. So then it fails. But once you've generated that SSH key, you can then use a tool like cat to print it out into the command line. It's OK. It's my public key. You can all look at it. And then we could copy it. Once you do this, you can then go to your settings, SSH keys, new SSH key, give it a name of git test, paste it in here. That SSH key then is valid for the machine that you're currently on. So I can click this, that's great. Um, and then I can use git commits between um, on this machine from GitHub to, uh, to my machine. So pushing and pulling is fine, but obviously you have to do this for every laptop or phone or tablet or whatever else that you're using. So you might find that you end up with 20 SSH keys and that's okay. Cool. Yep. 
Great. I think that we covered everything we thought about, right, Chris? I think so. I don't know if the audience wants to know more. Maybe not today, next time. <laughs> but for sure, uh, we still have a couple of minutes for questions in case. Let's see. I think that people seem satisfied. That's impressive. It's a good start. It's a good start. So yeah. does this mean that we can do another webinar? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> if you guys are happy, we're happy. OK, we are happy. Yeah. OK. When you have ideas, you please tweet them to us or email yes. them to us. Hello at womenplusplus.ch. Uh, or LinkedIn um, as well. Yeah, LinkedIn, however else you want to contact us, send ideas. Um, if you have speakers, if you want to speak, all of those things will be great. Um, yeah. And we have no idea how often we'll hold them either, I guess. So yeah, throw out your ideas. If you want it to be a monthly thing or every two months or while this is happening every two weeks, let us know and we'll see what we can arrange. Yeah. And yeah, thanks for the reminder with the materials. We will um, send them in an email tomorrow morning. And now we are waiting all of you to create your Git account and then uh, fork our projects on Women++ repository. <laughs> we will have a party then. <laughs> Actually, we should do a GitHub uh, post-COVID party. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. I'll end the meeting now. Thanks again. And thanks to Marta. Thanks to you, Chris. It was a pleasure to, to be speaking with you. And yeah, see you all again soon. See you soon next time. Cheers. Bye bye.